let's start with what you do right now. And then I want to kind of figure out what the origin story was in terms of your wealth building journey. So what do you do right now for, for work or for fun? Yeah, so I, I do a few things, actually. I own a, a, a couple of businesses in Rotorua. I own a, a real estate agency and a property management business that I um, have people managing for me and my wife. I'm a, a professional director uh, on some different boards. I run under contract um, a professional institute. Uh, I write professionally and I speak. I do quite a number of speaking engagements. So it's sort of a, a bit of a potpourri of different things that sort of make up the totality of my, my professional career, if you like. Like, obviously, you, you've got a lot of history with property. You comment on property a lot. You write a lot of articles that I've, that I've read around property. I think that's how I originally was introduced to you. Um, with your wealth building journey, do you want to just give me the high level kind of story around how you succeeded, any mistakes along the way and what you learned? Yeah, happy to. So first, it's worth just worth noting, and probably this is where everybody will turn off, that um, I don't have a degree or an education of, of, of anything beyond high school. So uh, I left school at, uh, at uh, 17 and went off to make my career working for what was called DIC at the time. It's the equivalent of what you farmers and then working in their furniture department. But one of the things I did do really early on and, and not long after that was I invested in um, real estate in uh, residential real estate. And I had read the, the Bob Jones books from the, the late 70s. So I'm, I'm, so, so I'm talking now the 80s, but he'd written in the late 70s. And so had some idea of, of what worked. The environment was different then, you could do different things. So so the first couple of properties I bought um, didn't require me to put any money in. Um, they had something called vendor finance where the people you were buying the property off could actually leave money in um, and did. And so I ended up quite quickly with seven different units. Um, within the space of about two years, one of which was a block of flats that had four units in it in and in a house and a couple of other properties as well. And by all accounts, was actually doing pretty well, but I was young and stupid and uh, sold those within about two years. For, for, for When I look back now, I still don't know why. Um, just did. I was an idiot. Um, if I was put my finger on one reason, I had a, a couple of, of, of um, units that had uh, bad tenants in them and I didn't particularly enjoy the, the experience of having to deal with them. So got out of that and didn't get back into it again until the early 2000s understood that stuff but sort of went right away from it developed my career in other ways did different things and then left hawks bay in the late 90s um, moved to palmerston north of all places um, and was there for two or three years in a, in a corporate role and then just sort of developed started developing my way up the corporate ladder and started investing in property again in the early 2000s coincident with that was the ceo of the auckland property investors association and then subsequent to that, a little bit later, the Property Institute of New Zealand, but sort of developed these roles which which were in parallel to what I was doing with property investing um, and got to the point uh, where, uh, I mean, we're not huge by, by comparison to some investors. We're not huge. I think we've got assets worth about 10 million at the moment, you know, so it's OK by some standards. It's certainly not huge by others, but it's but, but in terms of our expectations of life and what we want, we're pretty comfortable with that. So uh, and then the last few years, the equity that I've developed in those properties and and um, uh, has, has enabled me to buy additional businesses and, and to do other things with my life. So it's afforded me an opportunity to have a quality of life that I probably wouldn't have had if I hadn't invested in property um, all those years ago. So uh, it's been a pretty blessed life in respect of the opportunities that I've had. Um, and I use that word in its traditional sense. And, and I guess what you can draw from that is that some of it comes from up here and, and practical experience and some of it comes from up there. So... <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, let's, let's dig into the up there part as much as we can. Mm -hmm. So to get the origin story of the real Ashley church, let's, let's not talk about the investment or the wealth pit bed, but let's go back to your own personal life and possibly what might be <coughs> the most pivotal time in your life, I would guess. So take me back to the most important part of your life and describe that to me. There's, there's a range of different things that have happened to me over a period of time. And it's interesting because when I look back on my life and the point I'm at now, I, I can see certain things that had they not happened in a particular way, um, I wouldn't have ended up in the place that I'm in. So I've had the advantage of a number. But I guess if you, I, I guess if you were picking one, which is my coming to my faith, um, that even that didn't happen in the way that people, you know, that you watch the movies and, you know, somebody goes along and comes up to the altar and there's a big experience and they start crying. None of that. None nah, of that stuff. Um, I came from I come from uh, an atheist family. My family had no uh, no belief in God. Uh, grew up with that value system, and started looking into that stuff for myself. Uh, and in fact, before I started looking into it, I was antagonistic toward it. So I remember the reason I first started looking at faith 
was because I believed it was nonsense. And so I wanted to understand why these people would believe this nonsense so that I could attack it more vociferously and came to the conclusion quite quickly, as anybody who actually reads scripture almost invariably does, that it wasn't nonsense and <clears throat> that if you actually looked at it objectively and, and didn't try to impose other values on it and just read it for what it said, um, that it would bring you to, to a position which it did in my case. So by the time I was about 18, I had already started to develop a faith and it wasn't a, a come to Jesus moment. It was a slow progressive thing over a period of time and it was it was intellectual, not emotional. So, mm. so that, and that developed with me literally for decades, Darcy. Um, uh, I, I, if you if you'd said to me when did you become a Christian, I'd say when I was eighteen. When did you become a Christian? Much later, much much later in my life. I thought I thought I was doing things that sort of qualified me to be in the club, but but in hindsight, I didn't really. And I and it's because I wasn't applying that stuff. I understood it intellectually, but I didn't understand it experientially. And that's really only the last decade, maybe twelve or fifteen years, where. Uh, I've really started to apply my faith and and actually live my life and not just live it, but try to make sure that people understood that was what my value base was too. Right. And the reason why I probably should have started with this, but the reason why I think it's really important for us to have this conversation is, well, there's a lot of reasons, but linking it to the previous conversations that we've had recently around the extreme left, the extreme right, the conservatism, progressivism, call it what you like, there is a basis, there is a foundation within conservatism that seems to always come, seems to always come back to this Judeo-Christian belief. Why is what I want to know and, and, and how has that expressed itself over time? You know, uh, Because one's a consequence of the other. Um, and it's interesting when you look at, um, I've just been doing some study recently, I've just not long ago read Jonathan Kahn's excellent new book, Return, uh, Return of the Gods. And he talks about this stuff. He talks about uh, and we forget this stuff because we tend to measure um, history from from the time that Jesus walked the earth. And so we look at what happened after he, him and, and the changes that took place in society. We forget about what was happening prior to. But, and because that's through a, a, a particularly Jewish lens and the Jews lived a lifestyle which, albeit not perfect, was more in line with their God, we forget what else was going on in the Middle East and other parts of the world, which was barbaric. Children were being sacrificed to 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 Moloch and, and Baal and some of these other gods. There was terrible, terrible things going on. Um, uh, sexual immorality. There was a whole range of stuff that was... And, and the reason I'm mentioning that is because from the time of Christ onward, that all changed. So first in, in, in the Middle East and then eventually out into Europe and eventually right throughout the whole world. And there's this thing in Christianity called the Great Commission. It's go into all the world and make disciples of all men. It's this idea that the the value system that Christ articulated would be spread eventually throughout the entire planet. And so the values that you're talking about, the traditional values, are the direct result of that impact that Christianity had. They didn't come about in isolation from Christianity. They came out because of Christianity. They are the direct result of the Christian influence. And Christianity's history over the last 2,000 years is not one that's necessarily covered in glory because people are involved. And anywhere people are involved, you're going to have mistakes. And so you've got, you know, the shocking history of Catholicism for its first thousand or so years um, and and the Protestant Reformation that came about in about the, the, the 16th century. And Protestantism hasn't, co just, just, Protestantism hasn't covered itself necessarily in glory either, although it's moved steps closer toward that original vision of Christianity as it was first phrased. But for all of that and for all of those mistakes and for all of the, you know, the historic errors that have been made over that period of time, the progression of history has been incremental and slow improvement as a result of the application of traditional values. You take the traditional values out, the basis of the traditional lifestyle and the values that we hold eventually disappears. And, I, and I, I'm sorry if that offends people, but it's just a fact. And I know people will say, well, what about you know, uh, uh, some of the other religions, what about Islam, uh, you know, some of, the, some of the other great religions in the world, none of them have had the impact that Christianity has had on changing lives and changing communities um, in, in the way that that particular faith system has had. Right. So when you say, like, it might offend some people, like, I, and I understand that, uh, like, why, why do you think it is that this fella named Jesus, who was around 2000 years ago. Historically, that's been proven to be correct. He was literally here 2000 years ago. Why does that 
offend so many people so deeply, do you think? Oh, I, that's an easy one to answer. People won't like the answer, though. That's spiritual. There, there are, that, quite bluntly, there, there are, in my mind, and I've come, I'm absolutely clear on this view now. I may not have been when I was younger. There are two counterbalancing forces in the world, and, and one of them is good and one of them is evil. Um, and the, the evil one, but you can use whatever name you want to to describe it, but the evil one has an agenda which is around destroying the basis and the fabric of our society. And it's the thing which, bluntly, underlies some of the stuff that's going on on the alt-left and the woke movement and some of the other things at the moment. And again, as I say, if you read Jonathan Kahn's excellent book, uh, Return of the Gods, he covers this much better than I ever could. Um, but so the reason that people respond that way is because they're being affected by that. It's the same reason, incidentally, um, and I talk about this, I write about this a lot, it's the same reason that people have anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism is the most illogical, uh, not, that, not that any form of racism is reasonable, but it's extraordinarily, it's extreme when it comes to illogical. There's just no rational reason for it. It is a spiritual thing. It is, it is, a, it is a, a, a spirit of evil that impacts people. Um, that, and I know that sounds really churchy now, but there's no other way to describe it, um, that, that causes them to ha behave in a particular way that they wouldn't if they were behaving rationally or being impacted by, by positive influences. And so for people, I'd, I'd actually put that challenge there, Darcy, for people who are anti-Jewish, anti-Judaism, anti-Israel, I'd actually invite you to examine why you feel that way, because I, I suggest to you the reason for that has got nothing to do with any rational, uh, any of the rational reasons that you might think in your mind are actually causing that. So tying this into the previous episodes that we did, why is what you believe not a conspiracy theory? About those particular belief systems or about the, the faith in general? Faith, faith in general, like, like the, obviously oh. there's underlying facts, but then there's an opinion on top of it. Maybe you've just been brainwashed, right? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. That's a very astute question. Look, and, and I could sit here for half an hour and talk about that and it wouldn't make a, a blind bit of difference to anybody. The only way you can test it is go and read the same book. And, and you know, as I've, I've said to anybody who's ever asked me, you want an answer to that question? Spend three hours and go and read the first four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And if you can read those, and maybe the book of Acts, which follows on from them, if you can read those and you're unmoved, you disregard everything I've said. You can ignore me. You can treat me as a lunatic. But don't treat me as a lunatic until you've read those four, first four or five books first. Yeah. Okay. Well, I won't. I won't. I won't treat you as a lunatic. <laughs> 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 that would be slightly disrespectful and you might hang up on me right so you now you mentioned this book um a couple of times so I, i'm just going to flash it up on the screen for those that are watching um jonathan khan he's he's written a couple of goods the harbinger is one that i've read um really, really, yeah unbelievable so i haven't read the return of the gods i think that i will i think that i will yeah. um fascinating just to hear his other book though so yeah i can totally recommend that like there's no there's no shortage of stuff like that that you can kind of dig into. But kind of just going back to, to your own viewpoint, because I think I might, might have mentioned this before, that there, there's a lot of hills, there's a lot of mountains, there's a lot of hills that we can die on, right? That we can try to climb up of, uh, climb up and stake our claim, put, put the flag in and say that we, we fought a good fight. And a lot of those mountains today are ideological. We've chosen causes to get behind. We've found our tribe in that. We become entrenched. We get inside an echo echo chamber. We try to form our own cult. Like th these things aren't anything new. But what is it about dying on this hill that you feel so convicted on? Like you mentioned before, you've never been this convicted before on anything. What is it about this hill that you're basically dying on? Um, this is a, this is this is probably a bit shameful, but it's but it's but it's the answer to your question, and that is I'm getting older, um, and so there's an element of legacy in this. There's an aspect of there's a phrase that I constantly use of myself and also of other people, um, and that it's it's this, this this when you stand in front of God as as all of us will, everybody everybody watching this is going to die at some point, and every single one of you, whether you want to believe it or not, is going to be standing in front of your Maker. And your maker's going to ask you what you did with your life and how you devoted it to the things that he's called you on you to do. Um, and I constantly reflect on when that happens to me, as it will. Um, and I think about how I will answer that question. And there's a very good scene. Anybody who ever saw the movie um, Schindler's List, there's a very good scene, very powerful scene toward the end of that movie where Oscar Schindler, the war's over. It's all in black and white. And he's outside the factory where he had been. So Oscar Schindler, for those of you who don't know, basically paid... 
uh, saved Jews by paying for them to come and work in his factories. Um, and in doing so, was actually doing that not to make armaments. He actually designed his armaments so that none of them would actually fire, but so that he could save Jewish lives and save many, many people. And there's a, there's a powerful scene at the end where um, he's, he's uh, surrounded by people whose lives he's saved. And he's looking around and he's realizing that he's still got a car and he's got a gold ring and he's got a watch, an expensive watch. And he's, and he's realizing that for every single one of those items, that there were more lives that could have been saved. He could have sold them and he could have bribed more officials and saved more Jewish lives. And it's an extraordinarily powerful scene. And, and I didn't understand that until recently. And now I look at that and I realize that's actually true of all of us. And for me, uh, it doesn't matter what I do in terms of trying to help people to understand mortality and what lies beyond this life. But it's also about uh, looking for more opportunities to do that. And I haven't done enough. So for me, it's about legacy. It's about standing in front of my maker and being able to answer that question in a way where he's going to say, well done. And, you know, I know that's a hard thing for people to get their head around, but that's my motivation. Yeah, no, that, that, that's honest. Tell me then some of the challenging aspects of how this all works, because you, you have a faith in a God that increasingly, especially going back to some of the other conversations that we have, increasingly it's probably really hard to... I guess be strong in that faith, right? Not not just externally, but internally. Yeah, so maybe yeah. cutting off internally. Like, do you ever feel like you're not measuring up to some sort of standard? And how do you kind of? Uh, I, I that? certainly feel I'm not measuring. I, I thought you were going to ask me a different question. I certainly I feel I'm not, not measuring up to the question. I thought you were going to ask me was, do I find it difficult? And the answer to that is, I was born for a time such as this, so I don't find it difficult at all. Um, but, but, and if I'd been born 30 or 40 years before I was, I might've found it difficult because I would have lived in a society where this stuff is normal, but be, be, because of my obnoxious nature and my stubbornness <laughs> and my determination to do stuff, because I think it's the right thing to do. I love living in this time. It's, it's for me, it's a huge opportunity. And, and the fact that it's difficult fuels that challenge. It actually, and, and so, you know, if you think of, I mean, if I think of what I'm doing with my website at the moment and what I'm doing with, with, with LinkedIn and, and a book I'm currently writing about the prophecies of Daniel and the book of Revelation and some of the other stuff I'm involved in, um, that's all fueled by this. I love it. It's, it's, mm. it's recognizing that there is such a challenge right now and that I have an opportunity to do something to help people in that space. So, no, it's not, it's not difficult at all. Having said that, I recognise absolutely, Darcy, that it would be difficult for some people. And that some people, for example, and LinkedIn's a really good example. There's a lot of Christian people on LinkedIn, not necessarily church guys, but lots of people who've got a Christian traditional Christian background who find it difficult to mix that with what they see as their business identity. I get that. But, uh, you know, if, uh, people in that situation, I would say, take the leap because you'll be surprised how many people out there are actually supportive of that position. So t tell me about that then. Like you mentioned that maybe maybe 10 plus years, you, you've started to be a, a bit more vocal about this, I guess. How have you found that leap yourself? And what was the catalyst for you wanting to come out, so to speak? <laughs> come out, yeah. Um, surprisingly easy. So the catalyst was, was that recognition that I talked about before, that realization of the importance of of legacy and actually doing things that that Oscar Schindler moment, if you like, for want of a better thing. And by the way, there's a an article on my website. So uh, for me, it's there. It is well done. Um, so for me, it was that. And if you read that article, it goes into it in some detail. Um, but increasingly, over the last few years, as I, as I've ventured further and further with, for example, my social media, and, and and fully expecting that there would be kickback and being fully prepared to actually deal with that kickback. I found just the opposite. I found a very receptive audience. I found that my followers have increased. Not that that's a measure, but but it's just interesting to see that that relationship has happened. Um, and that there has been not just an acceptance of what I say, not just a sort of a tolerating that because of the other stuff that I write, um, but actually quite strong endorsement of that and quite support from some quarters. So uh, for anybody who's struggling with that issue, who feels that they want to do more in terms of their faith, but they worry about how it might impact on their professional career, take the leap. I mean, pray about it first, obviously, but take the leap. That's good. So now thinking about those that uh, aren't in that position to take the leap because they don't have that faith to begin with. Sure. I just, I'm curious just to know what your views are on the interrelationship between your faith and your wealth. Are they related? Are they They're completely totally related? Independent? Okay, They're totally to related to the point where uh, the first half of my life, it didn't matter what I earned or how much money I made, I couldn't keep it. I couldn't hold on to it. It would just, I, I, was, I was always in debt. 
Um, I, you know, I, I had a business in my early 20s which failed, um, didn't go bankrupt, but but ended up owing people money. Although even in that space, incidentally, I should hasten to add, uh, rather than taking the easy way out, I spent 10 years actually paying back creditors to make sure that people were put right in respect of, of the mistakes that I'd made. Um, and so by doing that, maintained my reputation and all the other stuff that it would have been far easier to say, hey, this is too hard, I'll just go bankrupt and start again, uh, which I'm very glad I didn't do. But uh, in terms of my my situation now, um, the, the hand of God, if I can use that term, is on everything that's happened in my life in terms of my wealth. And so while I'd like to think, you know, I write these very informed, you know, studious tomes about property and the property market. And don't get me wrong, the information on those is based on experience. And, you know, I would hope that it's reasonably good and is beneficial to people. But I can absolutely see the hand of God in my life. And so to the extent that I've been successful, uh, that's that's God. That's that's God's hand on my life. He's he's uh, chosen uh, to, to put me in the position that I'm currently in which is hopefully to be able to fund or to continue to fund some things that are important in terms of my faith. Having said that, really important caveat, if you read the book of Job, it doesn't always do that. In Job's case, he actually took everything off him. And uh, the reason he did that was to demonstrate that even if he wasn't wealthy, he was still going to, to, to honour his God, which he did. And then he restored his, his wealth and was even wealthier after that. But there's no guarantee that's going to happen. So could I lose everything? Absolutely. Will that impact on my faith? Not, not the slightest. Um, my, my faith isn't contingent on what I have or the position that I'm in. It's contingent on the relationship that I have with with my with my creator. Yeah, that's what Job said, though, right? <laughs> that was, that's the first thing <laughs> yes, it was. Mind. It's exactly what Job said. <laughs> well, let's not. Let's hope that doesn't come next. Then um, let's hope that's not tested. So um, now, you, I think you alluded to this before. So you're writing a book. What can I ask? What that book's about, and can you share any aspect of that? Yeah, you can. So about 15 years ago, I'd been a student of prophecy, which incidentally was what first brought me to my faith. Um, I've been a student of prophecy for 40 years, over 40 years. What is, sorry, what, what is prophecy, just for those that might not know? Well, prophecy is, is the, the, about a third of the entire Bible, both Old and New Testament, deals with, with predicting the future, about what's going to happen in the future. Um, and that's called prophecy. And so in the Old Testament, they had what they called Old Testament prophets, Daniel, Ezekiel, Isaiah, Jeremiah, who were great prophets who actually, the, the bulk of their books was actually God giving them visions about what the future was going to hold. Um, and I found it fascinating. And so there's a whole school of thought on this. It's called eschatology, uh, which has been around for a long time, over 100 years. Um, and there's some well-known speakers. In fact, there was a book in the 70s, which some people might have read, called The Late Great Planet Earth, written by a guy called Hal Lindsey, which kind of popularized this stuff. Um, but I've been into it for a long time. And I've never been comfortable with the current view of the modern Christian church on, on what they call end time teachings, which is this idea of what's going to happen in the last days, which if you believe this stuff, we're in right now. So I've been studying for a long time to find an alternative. I found one about 15 years ago from a guy who wrote this very obscure book that nobody ever heard of, um, and he subsequently died. Uh, and this book changed my life in terms of my understanding of prophecy. And I've been studying it for a long time. I just thought about what do I do with this? I've got this information. I, I, I understand it. About three years ago, I had been praying about it and saying, you know, is, is this a novel? Is it a book? Is it a novel? Is it a book? Didn't get an answer. So I eventually just wrote a novel. So I finished a novel about six months ago. Uh, which is now pretty much complete, and then realized I needed to write a book as well, because if I was going to refer people to this topic and, and the demonstration of these, this, this viewpoint, they actually had some, they have something they could actually go and pick up that wasn't a novel. The novel was more for they could send to friends and family who they wanted to share this information with. Um, so within a couple of months, I will have finished both, um, and I will probably self-publish them uh, early in the new year um, without wanting to over-egg them, they uh, they completely change the fundamental basis of the understanding of the prophecies of Daniel, and and go quite con some considerable way toward understanding Revel the book of Revelation as well. And those are the two key prophetic books in the Bible: ones in the Old Testament, ones in the New. Um, so it's one of the most important things I think I would have ever done. Um, although I do notice that when people write these things, they tend to die straight after. So you know, not a good look. But. Uh, <laughs> So we'll see what happens. Um, yeah. But yeah, we're looking forward to getting that out into the marketplace. Okay. So just, if, if I may, just a asking you a little bit more around that. So you mentioned the book of Daniel, um, Daniel chapter seven specifically is what I suspect you'll be drawing a lot from um, Revelation. No, no, the, 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 there's 12 chapters in that book and I'm drawing on the last six chapters. Oh, right. Seven, okay. Seven's one of them, but not just seven. Okay, no, that, that's cool. So you're talking, you're kind of talking about something that, from different perspectives in history, um, one would be, 
I guess John, and then the other one would be Daniel, seeing something from slightly different viewpoints. Uh, just to ask you a really controversial question, uh, because they're they're talking about the end of days, like that is full on. Are we in the end of days right now? Unquestionably, unquestionably, and we've been in them for the last seventy years, uh, which which is controversial in itself, but uh, it'll, it'll be explained in this book. Um, we're unquestionably in the last days. In fact, one of the of, there's a whole range of different indicators of the signs of the last days, but one of the really clear ones was from Jesus in Matthew 24, and he talks about this thing called the great falling away, um, or the great apostasy, and it refers to this time where society, which will have been, he's pretty, remember he's talking about this 2,000 years ago, he's talking about the fact that society will have had Christian beliefs for he doesn't he doesn't say 2,000 years, he doesn't mention any years. But he talks about the fact that society will have had Christian beliefs and that those beliefs will fall away dramatically very quickly. We've been in that for the last 70 years. Society has gone from being almost universally Christian to Christianity being, being very much now a fringe belief for uh, an ever decreasing uh, group of people. Absolutely entirely predicted. Absolutely entirely predicted. Um, but that's not that the book deal, talks about that, but that's not what the book's about. What the book talks about is firstly what those prophecies in Daniel really mean and then how they impinge on some of the prophecies in Revelation, and most importantly, what that means for us today. And it means some things that are quite different to some of the messages you're getting from what I call the end times church, which is around, you know, concepts of an antichrist and a seven-year tribulation and a whole lot of other stuff, which this book essentially demolishes. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, that'll be an interesting read for those who know stuff about this and those who don't, presumably. So... Um, looking forward to that. that. That'll be available primarily on your uh, your website if people want to. I, I may see if I can get a publisher to publish it, but I can't. I'll publish it myself. So uh, it's it's quite controversial. So it's entirely possible, or nobody will want to touch it. Um, in which case, I'll I'll put it out there myself. Yeah. Well, being being a, a fellow member of the fringe minority, I I know exactly uh, where you're coming from with a lot of that, and um, that's why I think it's just so cool to be able to talk to you about that. And for those that are that are watching or listening, and you want to kind of find out more about this, like this Jesus thing, what what could you do to point them in the right direction if they wanted to bravely consider this? So there's an, another article on my website called "The Real Meaning of Life." It's got a picture of Monty Python's life of Brian. If you read that article right at the end of it, it's got a couple of links on if you want to respond to that on how you can respond to it and where you can go and where you can get more information. Uh, conversely, my email address is readily available online. It's on my One Roof articles and on other places. Um, anybody wants to talk about this stuff uh, anonymously or privately, I'm, I'm more than happy to, to, to have that conversation with anyone. Cool. Oh, that's really awesome. Thank you so much, Ashley. Really appreciate all the time that you've given me. And um, I just hope that, that this actually does some good with some people. So um, thank you again for what you're doing and um, all the best with 2023, right? Thanks, man. Appreciate it. All right. Take care. Cheers.